I've been working on my Taka WebAssembly multimedia runtime again with a focus on it working not only in native, but also in web browser, as well as making basic apps simpler and smaller to make. Notice here less than 300k transferred, app less than 2k. But in doing this, I've been digging a bit more into interop between JavaScript and WebAssembly or WASM. So today, let's look at some things I've learned about getting data between the two sides. And in the case of Taka, I'm primarily focused on using Rust to translate GPU shaders and to do LZ4 decompression. But for a simpler demo for today, let's look at escaping HTML characters. And let's say this is the Rust function we want to expose to JavaScript. We want to make use of some textual string data and return a new string that has the characters ampersand and less than escaped. And if you go looking around, how do I make JavaScript and Rust talk to each other through WebAssembly, you'll find this thing called Wasm bind gen, where you apply this cool attribute, you can tell it the name you want to use in JavaScript, and yay, it just works. Here's the JS for it. I use this sweet module it's created for me. I need to init the Wasm loading, and then I can use the function escape HTML. I've done two things here. One, I have a simple message, and I print the escaped form. And then I make a longer one, and I just print the original length and the escaped length, because I don't really want to see thousands of characters in my output over here. Let's look at the build process. I call wasm pack build target web. You can also target node or other things. And this builds both wasm or WebAssembly as well as support JavaScript files. Let's look at the size of this output and other things along with it. The main things we're gonna care about are the wasm file, which is about 10K, and the support JavaScript file, which is about 5K. They also generate TypeScript definitions to help you out. And then given that, I can say, bun run use.ts and I need to escape my less thans and my ampersands and my larger string went from 33,000 to 40,000 and just for the sake of it let's see the time it takes to run this and worth noting that it's not always the same from time to time I've seen this as low as about 20 milliseconds or less anyway so yay it's easy no, we should look at what's happening inside. Even if all the code I wrote is this and this, we want to know more. So for example, what happens if I do this by hand instead of doing it the easy way through Wasm bind gen? Because I don't need to use Wasm bind gen to write WebAssembly with Rust. Here's a more manual effort. And if you notice, the core function escape HTML is the same in either case. But I have to do my manual exposure of it to JavaScript in this case. Let's go up a directory and get our bearings. There's the generated version. Here's the hand version. And I can just cargo build this as well, which I'd previously done, so it finishes fast. Let's look at the sizes on this also. Here we see my handmade version, which I have not yet run Wasm opt on, is about 18K. And notice my other one also got compiled to WebAssembly. Although I don't trust this to be the right output because it doesn't have the extra wasm pack magic on it. Let's see what I've done here to expose stuff. Whatever I want to expose to JavaScript, I want to put an X turn C on, as well as say, please don't mangle the names. And if I try to say, let's make my basic one an X turn C, or we pretend it's a C ABI when we're using WebAssembly. Oh, now I have warnings. X turn function uses type stir, which is not foreign function interface safe, FFI safe. Strings also aren't FFI safe. Inherently, Rust doesn't promise the C representation of these things. Unlike wasm bind gen, which goes to extra effort on how it's going to expose this stuff. I'm manually going to do that here. So things that are FFI safe are either specialized structs or things like pointers and some primitive numeric types. So I need to receive things I can work with and return things that can also safely pass back through WebAssembly to JavaScript. And I have to use unsafe to make use of pointers in Rust. So here I get a U8 slice from raw parts, then treat it as UTF-8, checking to see if it really is. Then I call my plain Rust function up here, and then convert it into a format that I know is going to be reliable to use through WebAssembly. 
And I'm also going to need some manual allocation and free functions for use from JavaScript as well. We'll see that in a second. Here's my C representation vec info struct that has all the things that a Rust vec contains inside of it, the pointer, the length, and the full capacity. And here I've said, let me control the memory Rust and put those parts of my vector into my vec info struct and then pass that back as a raw pointer for use from the JavaScript side. And because I said repr C, it means that I don't get complaints about interfacing it with extern C things. Now I made this generic with the idea that I can have pointers to different kinds of things. What really matters is that if I make vex of u8, there might be different alignment than vex of u32 or f64 or any kind of struct or anything else. So I focus for the moment on specifically allocating and freeing things that are vex of u8. Part of the things you should pay attention to when doing unsafe code in Rust or any other language. And to pay close attention here, notice that I never construct a vec that might be dropped. I only have a reference type here. When I do want to drop it from the free function, I purposely do construct a vec that then gets dropped and released on exit from this function. So presumably, these are the kinds of things that Wasm bindgen and Wasm pack are doing for us. Again, here's the manual version and the version that Wasm bindgen simplifies for us. And again, here was a TypeScript that we used for the Wasm bindgen version. And here's the manual JavaScript version. And note that my mains here are similar, but not quite the same. In the case of Wasm bindgen, I init my JS module as a whole and then use the top level escape HTML function. In my manual version, I instead made a class that wraps up that state. So I say module equals away init, then module.escape HTML. But other than that, they're the same thing for my main code. And for loading the Wasm, I hard coded the path out to my Rust target directory, which is probably not the best idea, but it made it simpler for this demo. And note that I'm using web browser APIs here because although Node doesn't support them out of the box, both Bun and Deno do support them. So I can write code here that's approximately the same as what I would write in a web browser, which is what I care about for the Taka multimedia runtime case. Meanwhile, once I've loaded up a WebAssembly module in the browser, I have access to the exports. And how am I going to use it's the next question. Well, here's the simple description of my functions that are exported. Let's actually look at that WebAssembly here. Down at the bottom, we see these exports in the WebAssembly text representation of my binary WASM file. We have the memory that's being controlled by the Rust code. And a lot of this code going along with it, I presume, is allocator-related stuff. By the way, side note for those of you familiar with the WASM4 WebAssembly Fantasy console, they actually don't quite play the same games as what I'm playing in my example today because they actually control the memory from outside the WASM code instead of inside of it. And here's the functions I'm going to be interfacing with directly. Escape HTML, allocate, and free 8, where the 8 again is 8-bit or 1-byte aligned allocation. And all that goes back and forth here are numbers. The length is a number, the pointer is a number, the response is a number. Typically, almost everything you do interfacing with WASM code is through numbers, or specifically even 32-bit numbers for WASM32. But there's nothing so precise in JavaScript, so I just say number. And then here's my interfacing to this function. There's my actual call to the raw escape HTML function. And here's my wrapper version of it. I have to encode my JavaScript string as a UTF-8 array. Then I have to somehow get that data into my WASM. So I need some space to store it in, which is why I have my allocation function. And if we look back here at this code again, what is returned is a vec info which I've used repr c to say the first thing's the pointer, the second thing is the length. So here I've gotten access to my WASM memory. Then from this data view, I can get a little Indian, uint32, which is going to be my pointer to somewhere in that Rust memory space. And I already know the length of this array because I told it how big I wanted it to be. Then I need to take my data that I encoded as UTF-8 and set it to that pointer position that I allocated from Rust. Then I can call my escape function passing in the pointer and the length. And now I have a new pointer, which came out from here, rather a vec info that has a pointer and a length inside of it. In this case, we don't know the length. It's whatever that escaped HTML length turns out to be, which was determined on the Rust side. 
So I do need to get not only the pointer, but the next four bytes over, which is the length of the output array. And I'm rewrapping the memory buffer here as a uint8 array, getting that slice out, which gives me another uint8 array, and then decoding the UTF-8 and returning it. Or I want to free both that output escaped buffer and the original one that I allocated to put the input into. Although I suppose I could have freed it as soon as this call was over. So that's one of the things I could improve on here. So we compiled it earlier. Let's run it to make sure we know that it works. We'll bun run the hand coded usage and we get the same result and we should time it again. I don't see any obvious difference in runtime between the WASM bind gen and my manually hand coded version. But to make a point of one thing here, notice I get the memory buffer to look at the contents. Then I get the memory buffer again to look at the contents after I've called escape HTML. And here's why. Instead of using this out view, let's use the view I constructed earlier to the memory buffer. Notice new data view memory.buffer. New data view memory.buffer. Looks like it'll be the same thing, but let's try using it here and see what happens. Oh, it crashes. And it crashes specifically at this point here, line 36. It says the underlying array buffer has been detached from the view or out of bounds. What that means is that while memory is still valid, memory.buffer no longer is. It's now a new memory buffer because when I said escape HTML over here in the Rust, new memory got allocated. And that actually asked the WebAssembly runtime for a larger memory buffer space, which means the old buffer is no longer valid and I have to get a new buffer from scratch. So let's use that new buffer and not the old one. And things work again. Or in other words, there are a lot of sharp edges, both from the JavaScript side and from the Rust side. So for comparison, let's actually look at what Wasm Bindgen pack did for us when it created this helper JavaScript file. Remember, that's the one that I'm using over here from the smaller JavaScript version. Here's our exports down here the default init, that's my init function that I called over here. I also need to use the exported escape HTML. Here it is. And we'll see some similar things to what I was doing in my manual version. In order to call the raw escape HTML, they're giving it a pointer and a length. Although in this case, they're juggling the shadow stack space inside of Wasm to manage the return pointer. But notice again, they're getting here a pointer and a length from the result after having passed a pointer and a length in, and they're apparently freeing things when they're done as well. And I think this one here is referring to one byte alignment, but I'm not entirely sure. Let's look at this pass string to Wasm while we're at it. That's where our pointer here is coming from. Notice we pulled out of the Wasm exports, uh, export zero and an export one, which are being used as malloc and realloc. And apparently if realloc isn't available, we do like what I did and encode all of that as UTF-8 up front, malloc some space, and then have that pointer and length available for passing in to the function, a function that Wasm Bindgen has invented because I didn't write that escape HTML friendly version. That's something that they've done internally as part of the processing. But if you do have realloc available, they get all clever and they sort of realloc as they go because they're not entirely sure how big that output space is going to be. So try to be a little more efficient in the memory and transferring that over encoding as they go into the Rust memory space. And what about that memory disappearing when new stuff gets allocated on the Rust side? Well, we'll notice here they're taking care of that also. Whether we're looking at uint8 memory or uint32 memory, we'll see that in a second. You see that they keep a cache of it and they detect when that cache becomes invalid. And if it becomes invalid, they create a new cache. And so the idea here is they're hanging on to things for as long as possible automatically and that get int32 memory is a very similar thing. But one interesting question here is how they're using an int32 array to access those locations. Whereas I used a data view. In Wasm, all the memory is defined to be little Indian always. And the way in JavaScript to guarantee little Indian output is to use a data view and pass in true for these getters. If you don't pass in true, or if you use these typed arrays in JavaScript, you use whatever your host default Indianness is, whether big or little Indian. So apparently the Wasm Bindgen folks decided that nobody uses big Indian hardware anymore, so it doesn't matter. So anyway, the goal with this kind of automated tooling like Wasm Bindgen for Rust is so that instead of writing code by hand, 
you can just write simple code and pretend it's easy. They'll do the heavy lifting for you. So another question is, what if you want these kind of handy tools or to find what your interfaces are for WASM, but maybe you're not using Rust? Well, there's WebAssembly interface types and WIT bind gen that target the more general use case. I haven't tried it out yet, but maybe we can in the future. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye y'all. That was loud. Uh -huh.